Each rock is a double dog dare to the mainstream marketing machine. Just try to market this. And the thing is, that's exactly what they've done. Consider the engineered rise of Limp Biscuit. Remember them? It turns out that the nastiest expressions of youth culture are manna to an industry ravenous for anything authentic to sell. Biscuit is a rage rock band that leaves critics cold, but ignites fans with incendiary lyrics. America first got to know them at Woodstock 99, Rage Rock's coming out party as covered by MTV. It's just one of those days! The heat burned on and conditions grew more intolerable. And for some angry concertgoers, songs like Limp Biscuit's Break Stuff became a mantra. Time to reach deep down inside. How does a band like them become superstars? Follow this well-tested recipe. Always on the lookout for the rawest of raw material, Jimmy Iovine, the enormously successful head of Interscope Records, finds a controversial band and packages them for the mainstream, all the while claiming he's just responding to demand. There's no way to stop a a movement in popular culture. There's just no way to stop it. It's going to happen with or without you. There's absolutely no way to stop that train. But when an Oregon radio station shied away from the band's crass lyrics, Interscope paid them to play one of Biscuit's songs 50 times. Then Interscope funded Biscuit's first video, which was premiered on MTV's nod to democracy, Total Request Live. I mean, I guess you could say Total Request Live is democratic in the way that, you know, this year's election was democratic. Um, the candidates, the field of candidates is very small. And there are organizations behind them, not unlike the Democratic and Republican parties, who are deciding which candidates get promoted. So, in other words, you can't just be, you know, Joe Fabulous, who's releasing your little indie record and get on Total Request Live. Having declared them worthy of a slot on TRL, MTV now also had a stake in making Limp Biscuit stars. The network put the band on their spring break special. When spring break aired, you could see a sales change the following week. And that's the kind of reaction that a killer performance at spring break gives. One part authentic rage, two parts marketing, sprinkle with cash, and place in a preheated oven called Woodstock 99. The night after Biscuit's performance, the festival erupted in flames. The band's goading of the crowd was blamed, perhaps unfairly, for the mayhem which ensued. By the time the smoke had cleared, four young women reported being raped. But the band had made the big time. Biscuit's lead singer became a senior vice president at Interscope Records. And the band's relationship with MTV had become so cozy that they put a picture of executive Dave Cyrulnik in their album liner notes and made casual drop-ins at their old stomping grounds, TRL. I just happened to be in Times Square. TRL was going on. I was like, whoa, what time is it? I was using my little two-way that day, and I got a right before the show started. Two-way uh, Carson he said, come on up. So when it came time to release a new album, Biscuit naturally turned to their friends at TRL to help sell it. And sell it did, faster than any rock album in history. Well, so this is kind of an important moment, you guys being on TRL. At some point today, you know, it's, it's weird to say millions of kids will go out and buy this record. I and thus a band is made. Of course, it's impossible to know what would have happened to Limp Biscuit and Rage Rock were MTV and Interscope Records not behind them. Hey, what's up? We're Limp Biscuit, and you're watching TRL if you didn't notice already. Perhaps they would have made it to the top on their own merits. But that's just the point. No one can ever know, once MTV and Interscope Records have placed their bets. The success of Limp Bizkit and Rage Rock was all but preordained. The cool hunt ends here, with Teen Rebellion itself becoming just another product. Often, there's a kind of official and systematic uh, rebelliousness 
that's reflected in, in uh, media products pitched at, at kids. It's part of the official rock video worldview. It's part of the official advertising worldview that your parents are creeps, teachers are nerds and idiots, authority figures are laughable. Uh, nobody can really understand kids except the corporate sponsor. That huge authority has, interestingly enough, emerged as the sort of tacit superhero of consumer culture. That's the coolest entity of all. So is there anywhere the commercial machine won't go? Is it leaving any room for kids to create a culture of their own? Do they even have anything that's theirs alone? All eyes are on our